There's this old saying that says, two is company, three is a crowd. And when it comes to the Cold War, having two nuclear superpowers makes things tense enough. However, the USA and Soviet Union weren't the only ones with nuclear weapons for very long. First, it was the Americans, then the Soviets, then the United Kingdom, then France. But when the People's Republic of China, or PRC, developed their own nuclear weapons, the Western bloc started to get worried. When President Kennedy learned that they were about to test their first nuclear weapon, he considered seriously using a nuclear weapon to destroy the test site. That's how dangerous the relationship was between communist China and the United States. Suddenly, it became really important to learn more about the supreme leader of the PRC, the elusive Chairman Mao. Unfortunately, the West didn't know much about him. What they did know is that he was a revolutionary, a successful military strategist, and that he ruled over the most populous nation on the planet. That's a lot of power. And as Uncle Ben taught us in Spider-Man, Remember, with great power comes great responsibility. Are you afraid that I'm going to turn into some kind of criminal? At one point, Mao kind of glibly makes the remark that the one thing that the PRC has going for it is the strength of its population. That if the PRC were to suffer a nuclear attack, they could still lose thousands, if not millions, of their own people. And it wouldn't really make a difference just because China was so populous. And so many people in the United States really thought about Mao as this kind of callous leader who wasn't afraid to sacrifice his own people for the success of his own vision. We all felt to some degree like pawns in the hands of leaders whom we didn't trust. The risk was so high that two nuclear powers might use nuclear weapons on each other and effectively on the world. As China quickly became a nuclear force to be reckoned with, many worried what sort of dynamic this would bring to the Cold War. Especially since by the early 70s, no one from the West had been granted entry to the PRC in over 20 years. The stakes couldn't be higher for the East and West to break the ice. But what if I told you that it wasn't Mao or even a US president that started the ball moving toward de-escalation, but instead a ping pong player and a happy accident? It's 1971, and we're at the World Table Tennis Championships in Nagoya, Japan. It's tournaments like these that bring people together from all over the world. Because on the other side of the ping pong table, somehow the opponent looks less like an enemy and more like a fellow human being. Connie Swiris was a member of the U.S. team at the time. I was really excited to compete in uh, the World Table Tennis Champions. The United States probably at that time was maybe ranked about 20 to 25. So my goal was to be able to at least win one or two matches in this world competition in Nagoya. The U.S. may have gone into the world championships with the simple goal of improving their ranking, but the People's Republic of China, a.k.a. the notorious PRC, came to dominate, winning gold for the men's team, women's singles, women's doubles, and mixed doubles. For at least one person in China, dominating in table tennis was just the tip of the iceberg. And that person was Chairman Mao. Chairman Mao is the total package when it comes to dictators. He has an iconic haircut, a scrappy childhood, and hundreds of millions of zealous fans willing to obey his every word, or else. Mao also had an impressive resume. In fact, historian John King Fairbank wrote of Chairman Mao's achievements, saying, Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, all the kings of Europe, Napoleon, Bismarck, Lenin, no predecessor can equal Mao Zedong's scope of accomplishment. Within a single generation, Mao transformed China from one of the poorest countries on earth into one of the largest industrial producers in the world. And he did so despite embargoes, military threats, and largely without foreign loans. 
By the end of his rule, he had reimagined one of the largest and oldest civilizations on Earth and successfully modernized it, all while erasing wealth disparity, empowering women, and dramatically raising literacy rates among young girls, doubling Chinese life expectancy as well as quintupling the nation's GDP during his time in power. But it wasn't all rainbows and butterflies, because this dramatic transition from a largely agrarian society to an industrial powerhouse certainly left some serious collateral damage as well. It's estimated that during the four years of his Great Leap Forward policy alone, tens of millions of people died from famine. Despite all of this, he's revered in China. Not only was Mao the political leader of the Chinese nation and the chairman of the Chinese Communist Party, but he was also the ideological leader of the Chinese people. He uses this phrase, the east wind is blowing over the west wind, which essentially means that the communist bloc is inevitably going to succeed over the capitalist bloc, which is represented by the United States. As you might imagine, this idea doesn't go over too well in the United States. Once the Chinese Communist Party rose to power and it became clear that the Chinese were siding with the Soviet bloc, this was really the beginning of what was referred to as the Red Scare. People were taught how to spot alleged communists and were encouraged to snitch. If a person defends the activities of communist nations while consistently attacking the domestic and foreign policy of the United States, she may be a communist. During this time, anyone who had even communist sympathies could lose their jobs, be forced to undergo interrogation, and would essentially be blacklisted within their communities. One of the most powerful and visible anti-communist crusaders is Richard Nixon. Mr. Nixon, what is the truth about our ability to fight the growing menace of communism? Our next president must show clearly that America won't stand for being pushed around anywhere in the world. Although Nixon narrowly loses to his arch-rival and America's handsomest president, he starts to develop an idea that China might be the key to gaining leverage against the Soviet Union. But the relationship between the U.S. and China had to get worse before it could get better. The relationship really began to take a downturn in 1950 with the outbreak of the Korean War, which in China was known as the war to aid Korea and resist America. From that point on, the United States was essentially seen as public enemy number one. In response to China's intervention into the war to aid Korea and resist a, or the Korean War, the U.S., along with the U.N., imposes a total trade embargo on China. Needless to say, the two nations were not on speaking terms. Starting in 1950, all Americans were basically expelled from the PRC. All American businesses were closed down. And if anyone chose to remain behind, many of them were either thrown in prison or forced to undergo thought re-education. Eventually, Mao has a falling out with the Soviets as well. On shaky terms with both major world powers, Mao decides to do what any self-respecting person would do after a messy breakup take some time to work on themselves. Diplomatic relations take a back seat, and the country as a whole focuses on trying to achieve communism. The problem with Mao is, with no international allies, the PRC is not really doing so hot. They're just flat out isolated. And if it continues for much longer, the east wind could be snuffed out by the west. This brings us back to Nagoya, Japan, and the Table Tennis World Championships in 1971. One day, Glenn Collin, who was one of the male table tennis players, got done with practice, and he didn't realize that the rest of us had already caught our bus to go back to the hotel. And when he came out, he couldn't find the bus, and so he just stepped on the next bus that was there, which happened to be carrying all of the Chinese table tennis players. A hippie walks onto the wrong bus. It sounds like the setup to a joke. Zhuang Zedong, who was number one in the world, I think, about at that time, came forward and kind of made a gesture and greeted Glenn. And he actually gave Glenn a silk screen picture of mountains in China. And Glenn didn't really have anything to give him. He just said, well, thank you very much. After they got off the bus, journalists photographed Glenn and Zhuang together. The next day, their image is on the front of newspapers across China. When Chairman Mao learns of this interaction, 
it sparks an idea. Two days later, something remarkable happens. The U.S. table tennis team is invited to visit China. Whoa. And at that moment, I think we all realized uh, this is something pretty big. This wasn't just a diplomatic move, but it was also a media coup. It was a media strategy. And so American viewers, alongside Chinese viewers, were able to see images of Chinese and American table tennis players shaking hands, exchanging gifts, embracing one another, and smiling. And this was a signal that relations between the two countries were potentially starting to warm up. What these two table tennis teams didn't know was that the President of the United States had been developing a plan for China for a number of years now. But it took this ping pong team to really get the ball rolling. Mr. Nixon is appearing in the doorway now, preceded by members of his staff and members of the Secret Service. Richard Nixon is elected in 1968 on a platform of restoring law and order after the turbulent and psychedelic 60s, a platform best explained by Cartman's inner ninja from South Park. Yes, and I am Bullrug, tough brute ninja who has dedicated his life to eradicating the world from hippies. Nixon's absolute disdain for both communes and communists makes his role as the guy who normalizes relations with the most populous communist country incredibly unlikely. In a primetime address seen by millions, he pitches his trip to China. I have requested this television time tonight to announce a major development in our efforts to build a lasting peace in the world. As I have pointed out on a number of occasions over the past three years, there can be no stable and enduring peace without the participation of the People's Republic of China and its 750 million people. That is why I have undertaken initiatives in several areas to open the door for more normal relations between our two countries. This announcement was shocking. The Washington Post writes, if Mr. Nixon had revealed he was going to the moon, he could not have flabbergasted his world audience more. A staunch anti-communist like Nixon going behind enemy lines at the height of the Cold War is like Ronald McDonald going to Burger King for a Whopper. I'll have a Whopper, please. Would you like fries with that? In October of 1971, I went back to China with Dr. Kissinger, and we began the official putting together of the presidential journey that would take place in coming February. One of the key items on the agenda was the Vietnam War, because China had great influence over the North Vietnamese. Nixon's plan is to keep things simple. A group of six to nine of his closest advisors meeting with the leaders of China and hopefully getting some face time with the ailing Chairman Mao. As the Chinese started getting a idea of the world interest in this, that it started expanding and it grew. Back in 1972, there are no Instagram or travel bloggers. So the coverage was the first and only opportunity for many Americans to see China. It became a royal wedding level media frenzy. At the end, it was called by President Nixon, the week that changed the world. I mean, it was a week long journey with 391 people. So when Nixon went to China, it wasn't just Nixon and Mrs. Nixon going to China. Everybody in America was tuned in day and night. The whole nation went with him. In order to get there, Nixon, his wife, and their entourage of 391 others travel from D.C. to Hawaii, then from Hawaii to Guam, and then from Guam to Shanghai. The journey took five days, but that was the easy part. When Nixon was en route to the PRC, he actually didn't know if he was going to be able to meet with Mao. At this point, Mao was getting up there in age. He was quite sick and suffering from a number of health problems. But it was really important for Nixon to meet one-on-one -on -one with Mao Zedong because it really signaled that the Chinese were taking this seriously and that they would potentially also be on board with an eventual normalization between China and the United States. The trip is full of way more pomp and pageantry than the ping pong team's visit. Everything is meticulously choreographed, starting with the opening handshake. A couple of decades previously, our Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, 
had refused to shake hands with Cho and Lai. And this was a real face issue with the Chinese. And President Nixon was well aware of that. As President Nixon came down the steps, he was greeted by Premier Cho Enlai. And Nixon sticks his hand out, as does Cho, and they shake hands. And it was understood clearly by Cho Enlai right there and then that Nixon was coming in friendship. While President Nixon was busy meeting with Chinese officials, Mrs. Nixon and her red coat tour the country with cameras in tow. And you had better believe that color was not an accident. In getting ready to go to China, we would have meetings of our top communications people. And one of our consultants was a man by the name of Tex McCrary. And Tex was always full of ideas. He said, I think we ought to put Mrs. Nixon in a red coat. And it turned out to be brilliant. And the first lady just stood out and it became very symbolic. Red in China meant success. So to the Chinese people themselves, it had meaning and it had provided a terrific visual for our first lady as she moved through China. While her husband was involved in diplomatic affairs, Pat Nixon was involved in what she referred to as personal diplomacy. So she really wanted to understand more about Chinese culture, and she wanted to be able to broadcast these meetings back to American viewers in the United States. So throughout her time in China, she was taken to places like the Beijing Zoo, she was taken to schools, she was even taken to various hospitals where she was introduced to the medical procedure known as acupuncture. This was new to American audiences, who would later combine the Chinese practice of alternative medicine with the American practice of capitalism to make a ton of money. Pat Nixon and other members of Nixon's entourage, including his personal physicians, they were able to witness actual surgical procedures of people having their chests cleaved open or undergoing cesarean sections with acupuncture as the sole anesthetic device. Now this was broadcast back to American audiences in the United States, and Americans were just enthralled by the procedure that the Chinese using something as simple as a lone acupuncture needle, they could achieve these miraculous bodily effects, things that the Americans themselves had not been able to even conceive of. The Nixons do some sightseeing together too, visiting the Great Wall of China. The president with Mrs. Nixon by his side talked about the symbolism of the wall that was in front of him and how walls could divide people and that he trusted that the journey that he was making would be uh, one that would unite people and get rid of the division. Nixon also makes an observation about the wall. I think that you would have to conclude that this is a great wall and that it had to be built by a great people. Yeah, it's in the name. One of the most impactful moments for Richard Nixon was when he was treated to a banquet at the Great Hall of the People in Beijing. Both sides raised toasts to one another, and after the toasts had been given, the Chinese orchestra began to play America the Beautiful. Well, Nixon, who was seated next to Zhou Enlai, turns to Zhou and says, America the Beautiful was played at my inauguration. And without missing a beat, Zhou turns back to Nixon and says, well, here's to your next inauguration. Both Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger described Zhou Enlai as being an extremely intelligent, very shrewd, very diplomatic individual, someone who was well-versed in world affairs, who knew a lot about world history, and who also paid very close attention to American politics. Now, Mao himself was not characterized as being a, a sort of standard diplomatic figure. The American journalist Edgar Snow, when he met with Mao and the early leaders of the Chinese Communist Party back in the 1930s, famously remarked that Mao, in the midst of his interview, took off his pants because it was so hot in the cave where he was conducting the interview. 
but Mao was exactly who Nixon needed to meet if he was to normalize relations. One of the most difficult parts of putting together the trip to China was that the Chinese would not tell us when certain things were going to happen. One of the key ones was, when will President Nixon meet with Mao Zedong? We had been told by the Chinese, oh, it will happen. But when we would ask when, they wouldn't be able to tell us. And so we never knew about that meeting with Chairman Mao until Premier Cho came to the guest house and said, let's get in the car and go. I mean, it was a surprise to everyone that it happened the way that it did and when it did. When Nixon first meets with Mao, Mao was very ill. Uh, he had to be helped to his feet by a female secretary. He apologizes that his voice isn't very strong because reportedly he had been suffering from bronchitis. So he just didn't have the same type of diplomatic know-how or diplomatic savvy as Zhou Enlai. At the same point, uh, Mao is characterized as being extremely intelligent, very humorous, very self-deprecating. In China, symbolism is very important. Uh, just like the red of Mrs. Nixon's coat, the symbolism of going over to see Chairman Mao is important. On the second to last day of their trip, Nixon and Premier Zhou Enlai made their nation's renewed and unlikely friendship official with the signing of an agreement called the Shanghai Communique. The Shanghai Communique, on the one hand, recognized that there were great differences between the two countries. There were differences in their culture. There were differences in terms of how they viewed Taiwan and the Koreas. But what was really significant about the Shanghai Communique was that both sides agreed that they were going to work toward peaceful coexistence and an eventual normalization of relations between the two countries. And that normalization of relations would eventually come in 1979. In a weird twist of fate, this historic breakthrough was helped by a hippie walking onto the wrong bus, which turned two ping pong teams into ambassadors that broke the ice. This interaction is nicknamed ping pong diplomacy, which definitely sounds more fun than normalization of diplomatic relations via sport. Writing about this visit years later, Nixon notes that the Chinese leaders took particular delight in reminding me that an exchange of ping pong teams had initiated a breakthrough in our relations. But Chairman Mao may have said it best, the little ball moves the big ball. He really does have a way with words. After the success of his trip to China, Nixon became the first U.S. president to visit Moscow, where he met with the leader of the Soviet Union, Leonid Brezhnev. During the summit, Nixon and Brezhnev sign an agreement that paves the way for the Apollo-Soyuz test project, the first manned international space mission, and the first strategic arms limitation treaty, known more conveniently and tastily as SALT. Back home in the United States, Nixon is flying high. His approval rating soars, and wouldn't you know it, it's an election year. He wins in a landslide, carrying 49 out of 50 states. Nixon's foreign policy ushers in a new period of the Cold War, detente, which is fancy for relaxation of strained relations. In the coming years, the U.S. and USSR continue their arms reduction talks and commit to diplomatic cooperation. Plans are made for a Soviet-American joint space flight as peace finally is in grasp amidst the Cold War. Good evening. In all the decisions I have made in my public life, I have always tried to do what was best for the nation. Therefore, I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. After all he accomplished meeting with Mao, meeting with Brezhnev, winning 60% of the popular vote, Nixon resigns two years later. Maybe you've heard this term before, Watergate. The Watergate crisis was heartbreaking. It was a disaster, and the ramifications to the nation were horrible. When the law and order president breaks the law, who can be trusted? When Nixon leaves the White House for the last time as president, an era of confidence and optimism leaves with him. 
And as the 70s comes to an end, the frail peace between the U.S. and the USSR thins to a breaking point. The 80s brings us new trends and new leadership. And all the while, the nuclear arms race is back in full force. And for the first time, the USSR surpasses the American nuclear stockpile. It's time to put on your most radical leotard. Let's begin with the warm-up. Because the Cold War is heating up again. Thank you.